God bless you. You may be seated. Let's pray. Lord, we come to this time of your word. And we thank you that you're so gracious that you, you do. You send your word to us. And we pray that you'd help us to have open hearts. We pray that we would be the kinds of vessels that would receive and also give your word to whoever would need it. We thank you, Lord, because you are here. You are here. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. You are here. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord Jesus. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And we rest in your presence. Because you are here. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. Praise God. Mm. Oh, they're gone. I wanted to say thank you, Brother Omar and team. It's not just singing, it's, it's feeling the presence of God and conveying that, praise the Lord. It's September, and there's still some back to school feeling in the, in the air and in the stores. Uh, there's always so much that needs to be bought. Any parents here? Did you get a raise for back to school? But there's so much that always seems to need to be bought for, uh, you know, whatever, clothes, uh, materials for all these different projects. Uh, but for years, uh, back to school for us meant time for a big trip to Buffalo, to the outlet mall. The actual location, I don't even think it's in Buffalo. It's probably Niagara Falls, New York. But we just called it Buffalo. And we bought jeans and jackets, uh, Timberlands, backpacks. Any, anybody make that trip to Buffalo? And then we went to eat at that big buffet restaurant. What was that place called? Old, old Country Buffet? Is that the one? Eating as much as you can eat. But uh, anyway, the shopping, about the shopping. The prices were great, but that did not always mean that you were getting as big of a bargain as you felt like you were getting. Why? Because of the exchange rate. Uh, the value of the Canadian dollar versus the U.S. dollar, it would change from year to year, sometimes from one week to another. You know, Brother Mike and Sister Suzanne would go over and they say, oh, we, we got X amount exchange rate. We go the next weekend. So values change, and the value of the Canadian dollar certainly changes. Uh, there was even a time when the Canadian dollar was was worth more. It was higher than the U.S. dollars. And that is definitely not the case today. Actually, take a look at that. Way up in the corner there, that's when we were at parity, or I think we were a dollar two U.S. But that was, I think, in 2012. So it's been a while. <laughs> but this message is a conversation about what we value and how, 
how that can change. As we just saw a few seconds ago, values change, right? The value of the Canadian dollar only changes based on how much people are demanding it. If everybody wants one, the value goes up. Nobody wants one. <laughs> so values change according to what it is we want. Our values change. What, what we value can change over time, and we might not even notice as it's happening. So let's pause for a minute and think about it. What is growing in value in your life? And what is losing value? What are you, what are you caring more about, and what are you caring less about? And where does God fit? How are you valuing God? And how does your valuing of God fit in with you're valuing of other things that are important to you. Are your values aligned, more or less consistent with each other, or are they all over the place? Sometimes we can have conflicting values, right? Values conflicting with each other so that we, we end up feeling torn and uncertain. But let's take a trip back in time. We're going back about Brother James had a birthday. Where is he? Did we do birthdays today? <clears throat> Somebody knew is 50 years old. So, big hand for Brother James, trying to look very quiet there. So, we are going to take a trip back in time to about when Brother James was born. We're going back about 3,800 years. <laughs> so then you're not living in a house or an apartment or a condo. You're living in a tent. And surprisingly, though, it's a big tent. Everything you need is there. Have you seen these ads for glamping? Oh, you guys are you, you're from that continent where they glamp in these big safari tents like hotels. Right? So, so when I say you're living in a tent, it's, it's, it's not a little Canadian tire thing. Everything you need is there. Your family's been running a pretty good, no offense to Canadian tire, your family's been running a pretty good business, raising sheep, selling wool, cheese, yogurt. You, you have basically everything you need materially. But there's something you really want, something you really value. In fact, you've decided that this is something you absolutely need, something you'll do whatever you must to get it. And this something isn't exactly a thing. It's, it's invisible. But you know it's real because you have seen it in action. It's in fact, what has enabled all the wealth and goodness and provision and protection uh, around you. It's what makes your family different from all the others. It's something called the blessing. Or you could call it the promise. Or you could call it the presence. Your father Isaac has it. His father Abraham had it. And he got it directly from God. We'll read about it in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 2. God said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And he confirmed that promise again in Genesis 13. We pick it up in verse 14. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, God said to Abram, lift up your eyes now and look from the place where you are. So I want to stop there and, and say, hey, wherever you're sitting now, lift up your eyes and look. East, do you know which way is east from where you're sitting? I think it's that way. But he said, lift up your eyes 
from the place and look from the place where you are northward southward eastward and westward okay I didn't see everybody look in each direction why is it important to do that for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth then your descendants also could be numbered and then he said stop looking and do what arise and walk in the land through its length and its width for I give it to you imagine a promise like that and uh, let me just say beyond anything else the presence of God with him is what made Abraham Abraham the father of nations known as the friend of God so back back into the tent back into the story here who are you in this tent who are you in this story uh, you choose you you can choose to be Jacob if you want or you could choose to be his brother Esau now Jacob wanted this blessing more than anything else on earth but who was in line to get it Esau so choose which one you'd like to be now Esau felt like life is pretty good as it is the blessings probably come in my way anyway sooner or later no need to think too much about it really so come on grab a bow grab some arrows let's go hunting hunting <laughs> um, I worked in the south for a little while but Jacob did not grab a bow and go hunting he stayed home thinking stirring a pot and thinking what do you think was on Jacob's mind possibly huh how do I get that blessing how do I get the promise how do I get the presence of God in my life for good and he kept thinking and he kept stirring the pot after a long while Esau came home he was empty-handed tired very hungry at that time Esau's mind was very clear about what he valued right he was starving he was thirsty he wanted some dinner and he wanted it now so meanwhile Jacob still stirring a steaming hot pot of stew he says you can have this you have all of it if you give me your birthright in exchange Esau says what good is a birthright to me if I'm dead I'm gonna die here man what do I care about a birthright I'll take the dinner you can have the birthright now quick explanation that birthright was a tradition that gave the eldest son twice the inheritance of the others but Esau traded it away now after after he was full and satisfied Esau's values changed Hebrews 12 verse 17 reading from the NIV it, it tells us that afterward when he wanted to inherit this blessing he was rejected even though he sought it with tears he couldn't change what he had done is there a steaming pot of stew in your life something that is available right now short term right there sometimes sometimes that steaming pot is a relationship that's right there available for you but every time you think about it you know it's there but you know for you sometimes it's some plan your friend has about how 
you know, the two of you can make tons of money really fast, but you'd have to drop out of school to put your time into it. And you're going, hmm. But it seems so right there, right? The point about the steaming pot is that it's right there and it smells great and it seems like exactly what you want. And yet inside, you know. And for every steaming pot, there is a price. It robs you of what could have been yours longer term with a little more waiting and a little more work. It's up to each of us to decide what we really value. And today, I hope we can become more conscious about that choice, right? So that we make it more, so that we make more purposeful, more deliberate decisions about what we will value more, the steaming pot of stew, or the birthright. What does this concept of a birthright look like for you and me? You've been born into the family of God. In case you haven't yet, you can choose today to be born into the family of God. You can be baptized into the name and identity of Jesus Christ. Washing away every sin you've ever committed and rise from that water to live a new life. A life that's filled and led and enabled by the Spirit of God. You become an heir of God and joint heir with Christ, ready to inherit eternal life. Now, I find that amazing. I, I find that amazing. You, 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 can, you can be... Okay. I'll go on forever about that. That's the problem. <laughs> now, fast forward from that tent where the two brothers were making a deal and we're, we're moving forward about 500 years in history. And the descendants of Jacob are now no longer living in tents. They're no longer independent farmers and entrepreneurs. Instead, they're living in rows of little houses in Egypt, and they are slaves. Who are you in this story? Are you one of those slaves? In fact, you're not. You're not a slave, and you're not packed into one of those little laborers' houses. You live in a palace made of marble and gold, and you're surrounded by leathers and silks and spices. You have servants to take care of your every need. You are educated and advised by some of the best minds in the world. You're loved and respected, and you are being carefully groomed to rule the greatest empire on earth. You're smart, you're strong, and you're ready to take your place and make your mark on history. You are Moses, Prince of Egypt. And what exactly did you do, Moses? Hebrews 11 tells us what you did. We'll read this from the Amplified Bible. Hebrews 11, 24 to 27 says, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he preferred to endure the hardship of the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ, that is, the rebuke he would suffer for his faithful obedience to God, he considered that to be greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt. For he looked ahead to the reward promised by God. By faith, he left Egypt, being unafraid of the wrath of the king, for he endured steadfastly, how did he endure? 
as seeing him who is unseen. King James it says, as seeing him who is invisible. Moses had a big choice to make, and that's how he made it, by not looking at what was right in front of him, but seeing what was invisible. If that was really you and Moses' situation, is that the choice that you would have made? What are the situations in your life that invite you to choose between what is seen and what is invisible. Well, once we went to someone's house, just for a quick visit, but while standing in the doorway, I noticed something hanging on the wall behind their kitchen table. It said, Christ is the head of this house. But then it said, the unseen guest at every meal. The silent listener to every conversation. So it's letting people know that when you sit down at this table and we're talking, there's somebody here that you can't see. The family was encouraging everyone who came there to see beyond the scene. To see or at least imagine the one who is invisible, but yet right there. It's a good thing to do. In the middle of a situation that you're in, just before something you're about to do, just before something you're about to say, to see the one who is invisible. He's right there with us always. He is here. He is here. In fact, as the Apostle Paul described it in his TED Talk in Athens, well, it wasn't called a TED Talk, but he spoke in Athens, and he said, in him we live and move and have our being. So let's be conscious of that, um, but not just conscious of it. Let's value that. Let's value his presence. If we value the presence of God, then we don't want to do or say things that would grieve him. We don't want to drag him into situations, right? If we know God is with us, then we don't want to drag him into situations that are definitely not godly. In fact, that's a dangerous thing to do. Ephesians 4, verses 30 to 32, we'll read it from the New King James Version. It gives us a warning and some good advice. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Because by him you are sealed for the day of redemption. So, and here's the, that's the warning. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. This is what seals you for the day of redemption. But here's the advice now. Let all bitterness, right? If you don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, what should you do? Well, let some things go. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, along with all malice. And be, just go ahead and be kind one to another, tenderhearted. But wait a minute, some people really do you wrong. They do, they do. They say some things, say that. Forgiving one another. And he throws in, uh, by the way, even as God in Christ forgave you. 
So God is saying, I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't already done for you. What do we value more? The presence of God, the leading of God's Spirit, or the ability to express whatever the elemental emotion is that we are feeling at the time. Think about your own life. What are you valuing less these days? And what are you valuing more? We, we can ask ourselves questions like this, right? Ask yourself, what, what do I want more? To be rich in the spirit, to have an amazing relationship with God, to be able to help people through the power of God's spirit? Or is my mind actually more focused on material things, things that, that, that I can touch or taste or buy? Or could it be that I'm, I'm focused on psychological assets like power and control or attractiveness? or status, right? What is it that I am really valuing? And compared to everything else that I value in life, to what extent do I value God? Some of you know that I like tea. I like making tea, drinking tea, all kinds of tea, black tea, white tea, green tea. Did you know there was white tea? Yes, there is. Green tea, herbal tea, a couple of years ago, I said that I was thinking about starting a tea business sometime. And you know, lots of people say lots of things and I didn't want to be one of those people. So today, that is all real, did it. I've been selling fair trade, sustainable, luxury grade tea on Amazon. This is not a commercial. Don't go looking for it because I'm stopping it. I'm, I'm not gonna do it anymore. What I valued I realized something, that what I valued about that experience was getting it done and understanding how that whole platform works and all. I wanted the learning, but, but I don't value doing it forever. <laughs> I don't find that it's really worth it financially, but anyway, now I'm, I'm going to sell just through one retail outlet in the market on Granville Island in Vancouver. Why? Because I realized that what I value in this venture is the fun factor. I get a chuckle from knowing that the only place to get that tea on earth with the stylish Mackenzie M on the package is going to be on Granville <laughs> Island. And that doesn't have to matter to anybody else is my brother, and I get a kick out of it. So, there you go. That's the only place you can get Mackenzie tea is on Granville Island. <laughs> and, right? And it does not have to matter to anybody else. It's, it, it's what you value. That's how you make your decisions. Um, plus, that officially makes our family coast to coast, Atlantic to Pacific, right? From Nova Scotia to BC. So, and that's just fun for me. So knowing what you value helps you to make choices that are important to you. Okay. You, hold on. Anybody here drink tea? Oh, oh, yeah. I realize I'm telling you about this tea and I'm not showing it. Um, okay, the, oh, this one is masala chai. So any chai drinkers, come, this is yours. This is masala chai. This full-bodied tea features South Indian masala spices and blah, blah, blah. Sister Green, let's have a hand for Sister Green. There you go. Chai drinker. Okay, and now... Okay, this is for somebody sophisticated. This is jasmine green. A green tea with surprising body and captivating floral character. 
accentuated by specially selected May jasmine blossoms for a beautiful person. <laughs> I doubt. Je m'excuse, madame. Je ne t'ai pas vu. Okay. All right. Now this one. I hope. I hope this one is good for you. This one is called Serenity. Soothing and restful, with the blessings of chamomile and a bevy of botanical buddies, hints of citrus will leave a relaxing light. Finish. Serenity. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, how do you know what you truly value? Because if you ask me what I value, I can give you a list of things that I value. How do I know what's, what I really truly value, right? Versus what you tell yourself that you value. Think of the word T as an acronym for time, effort, and attention. So my T buddy, God, showed me that this is how we humans define what we value. He did. He was sitting there he's saying, you know how you humans define value? It's by what you devote. So if you really value something, you will notice that you spend time on it, right? You put effort into it, and at various hours of the day or night, it gets your attention. If you're like me, your eyes and ears reach out and research and find information about this thing that you value and you're interested in. Does that, does that happen with you too? So TEA, think about it. It's what we do about things that we value. You could put an M on the end as well, if you wanted to, to indicate money. Um, whether we have just a little bit of money or a lot, when we, have time, when we have the chance, we do like to spend it on what we value. But even if we have no money at all, we still spend, we spend our time our effort and our attention. And this is how we define in real life what we value. Now, what if there's a mismatch? What if we're not having tea with who and what we really want to? Well, the good news is, who's the one that can change that? We are. For example, if we truly do value God above all else, we can make that real. We can demonstrate our valuing of God in how we spend our, how we spend our, and where we place our attention, right? This, no, this, this could bring up some questions. Like, what about all the other needs of life? Does valuing God mean that I devote all of my time, effort, and attention to God? How can a person do that and still function in the world? Wouldn't I be so heavenly minded that I'm no earthly good? Anyway, these are good questions. What if you're a nurse? Does valuing God mean you don't go to work? You stop taking care of people and um, instead you just stay home and pray? Actually, if you think about it, your choice of nursing as a career might itself be an expression of how you value God and how you've chosen to serve God by serving people. That could be just as true if you're a landscaper or a cleaner or a mechanic or a teacher. You can show how you value God in the way you do your work, in the way you serve others, in the way you excel, right? You have a choice in what you will spend your working life doing and it's also important to think about why you do what you do and how you go about doing it. What's, what's your focus? What is your 
intention or, or what is filling up your mind as you go through your day? What is the thought world that you're living in? Is it, is it all dark and stormy? Or are you bringing the sunshine into your space? What is the soundtrack in the back of your mind as you move through your day? Now, th that is more important than you might think. Because in some ways, oh, Grant, oh, not Grant, Pastor, um, is back there. He told me something one day that a friend told him. He told him, program the music that programs you. Because whatever it is that you kind of have habitually playing or going on, it is programming you in ways that you don't even realize. You better program it, right? And choose what you want programming your mind. Choose carefully. This message is about, it's to get us to live more deliberately and less automatically. Right? It's good, in fact, it's necessary to consider and meditate on what are the values that are guiding how you think and how you make choices. What emotions you allow to populate your mind and drive your words. All of that. It's important for us to be deliberate and purposeful about it. Because there is an enemy. And there is a world environment. And there's a whole lot fighting against you valuing God. So we need to think about what is the spirit that influences how you feel about the things that happen to you. Is it your own human spirit? Is it the spirit of the world? Or is it the Holy Spirit? In terms of what you find rewarding, okay? What do you find more rewarding? Pleasing your own self or pleasing God? What makes you feel... Okay, I, 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 nothing against Frank Sinatra, dear departed soul, but, 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 but I am going to mention a little song, and you probably know the title already, right? But more, much more than this, I did it. So, so, okay, but think about that. Is that the most important thing for you? I did it my way. Or I did it... Yeah, what do we find more rewarding? Pleasing ourselves or pleasing God? We might... And a choice like that can come up suddenly. Sometimes when we least expect it. Okay, we might be in the middle of a, an uneventful day. And all of a sudden, here's an opportunity for a quick profit or a quick pleasure or to gain an advantage over somebody in a shady way or some other thing that we could go for, but it's not quite right. Very often, we go ahead and react right in the moment, just boom. And then afterwards, that night when you go to pray, you're like, oh, gee, I, I should not have done that. And I knew at the moment, or actually, I shouldn't, but I did. And it's, yeah. Why? Because we tend to react in the moment. But what I would like to bring you, it's invisible, but it's there. It's a pause button. It's on every remote, <laughs> and it's in every moment there is a pause button. We can ask ourselves, if I do X, how would that affect the presence of God in my life? And then we can choose. All right? If I do this, how, you, you ever done something, just react in the moment, and instantly you can feel the, the pain that God is feeling? How will this affect the presence of God in my life? And then choose Psalm 19 can help us in these moments of choice. To, it, for me, Psalm 19, 7 to 11, I like it because it's 7-11. It's open all the time. 
Psalm 19, open all the time. 711. Anyway, let's read those seven verses, or the, whatever they are, 7 to 11 of Psalm 19, because it helps you make choices in terms of what's important. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. What does it do? The statutes of the Lord are right. What do they do? The commandment of the Lord is pure. What does it do? Helps you see some things that you weren't seeing. Enlightens the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and it endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and they are righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. And them sweet, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. And here's a little experience piece. Sometimes you're not sure. If I go God's way, oh, that's going to hurt me. It's going to cost me. It's going to whatever. But it says, no, 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 no. In keeping of them, great reward. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So once I got into Psalms and I hit Psalm 19, I, I couldn't, you know what it's like. You got your book. You, I couldn't shut the book. So ended up in Psalm 37. Look at what Psalm 37 says, verse 4. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you when we delight ourselves in the Lord, when we seek first the kingdom of God, as he puts it in the New Testament, and we live according to his righteousness, then everything else comes along. As the psalmist puts it, God will give you the desires of your heart. Now, the word of God, we've just been reading through some verses, but the, the, the word of God has the power to transform you and me the more we take it in. And that is a choice we can make, to allow God's word to occupy our minds and allow it to affect the way that we think and feel. Something else is true, though. We can't do that, or is it, we can't at the same time be filling ourselves with other things. I say we can't, we do it, but it doesn't work so well filling ourselves with other things and allowing into us the influence of other spirits like fear, violence, greed, lust, anger. If you keep feeding or feasting sometimes on a lot of nasty, not God, I said feeding, feasting, I could also say binging, on a lot of nasty, not godly stuff, you'll notice that you're becoming uh, double-minded, triple-minded, messed up human. Or worse yet, you won't notice. It'll happen and you don't even realize that you're shifting. Hopefully, you have a sensible friend who can point out stuff like that to you. But you do have the Spirit of God who will point it out as long as we don't keep grieving them. Okay. For everyone who values God. Anybody here value God? So for everyone who values God, guess what? Did you know that God values you? Check out, I, I want us to look at some, so it is some of the last words in the Old Testament from the book of Malachi. This is Malachi 3, verses 16 to 18. Look at this. It says, then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. 
And, okay, I might add a little bit in here. And God said, hey, Gabe. Gabriel, his angel. Gabe's right. Hey, Gabe, get a book, get a book. And start writing. So a book of remembrance. God said, I don't want to lose this. Look at these people. They've, you, you know, a, a book of remembrance was written before him. For who? For those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Amazing. This is a God of heaven. This is the almighty one. This is the creator of all things. And when you decide to spend time with God and meditate on his word, God says, oh, we got to write this down. This is so good. And, but it's not done. It says, what's special about these people? They shall be mine. <laughs> says who? Says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I make them my jewels. Over the past week, we've been seeing celebrations. We've been seeing crowns and jewels and things. Like God says, oh, I'm going to make them my jewels. You want to see the glory of God. You want to see the wealth of God. You're going to see it in my jewels. I, And I will spare them as a man. Because if you're like me, every time I go to pray, I'm like, oh, dear God, you know I'm guilty. You know I'm, you know, I mean. And God says, and I will spare them. Okay, I'll keep reading in a minute. Yeah, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And then you shall again discern. God is saying, there are two people in this, two kind of people in this world, and you're going to see. You'll, you'll be able to discern between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who just doesn't. course, like it was with Psalms, I, I got reading that. That was the end of the Old Testament. I couldn't put it down. I went to the end of the New Testament. God values so much. Look at what he is planning for you. Revelations 22. We'll pick it up in verse, <laughs> right, right at the start, verse 1. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face. Remember we talked about seeing him who is invisible, and now he's visible. They shall see. Everything that you believed in and you wondered sometimes, is it real? They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun for the Lord God 
gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. This is what God has in store for them who value him. For those whom he values so much. The early Christians used to say as a greeting to each other the word Maranatha, which means the Lord is coming. It was to remind them that in comparison to that one big truth, everything else is just noise. Let's remember that in all of the commotion of our lives. Let's value God above all else. And make our choices with God in mind. So, I want you to stand if you want to live in a way that demonstrates that you value God most, then I want you to stand and make that commitment to him. God, I'm going to live in a way that demonstrates that I value you above all else.